Okay, welcome everybody. This is now the second um, seminar organized by the Network for Integration of Speciation Research. Um, this is a newly funded um, network funded by ESEP, the Evolutionary Biology Society. And um, the name is meant in two ways. On one hand, we want to integrate across different study systems. So we are um, generating a framework for allowing comparative studies. Um, on one hand, we are generating a database of speciation. And on the other hand, we also have workshops and this seminar series. And then on the other hand, we also aim to integrate speciation researchers so that we can uh, bring together researchers from different parts of the world, different career stages, et cetera. And to this end, we also have this seminar series, which is a seminar every month at different times so that people from different time zones can attend. Um, it's always one hour of talks with short questions right after the talk um, where we have two speakers per talk session and then 30 minutes of general discussion in a different Zoom session. At the end of the talks, um, we will give um, instructions on how you can join the discussion session. So there will be time for very short questions um, right after the talk and please put those in the chat. And with that, I would like to introduce um, Renske Onstein, who will be our first speaker. Um, she did her undergraduate and master's studies in biology at the Wageningen University in the Netherlands, where she worked on coevolutionary relationships between butterflies and plants. Then she moved for her PhD to the University of Zurich working on evolutionary radiations in flowering plants. And after postdocs in Amsterdam and Paris, she started her own group on evolution and adaptation at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research in 2018. Her group studies interactions between macroecology and evolution, mainly focusing on plant radiations. And with that, Renske, the stage is yours. I look forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. All right. So thanks very much for inviting me to talk a little bit um, today about you, um, about my work. So I'm going to focus a lot on the role of megafauna in, in plant radiations, focusing on the, on the palms, the tropical uh, plant family. Um, and the topic for today is on adaptive radiation. So I think we can later on discuss whether the examples I will give are, yeah, could be adaptive radiations or, yeah, if we would need additional tests for that, right? To say something about that. So the thing I'm most interested in is looking at biodiversity patterns on a global scale and understanding what drives the differences in diversity patterns across regions. So of course, the tropical regions are particularly diverse, species rich in this case, um, here for vascular plants, but we also see this for other groups of organisms. And one of the idea, ideas or hypotheses is that this richness is the result of the extraordinary number of biotic interactions happening in the tropics. Um, so groups of organisms which could support both the diversification, but also the persistence over longer time of other groups of organisms. And one of the most prominent biotic interactions in the tropics is, is frugivory. So it's a mutualism between animals that feed on the plants, the plant fruits and disperse the seeds. 
And of course, the plants benefit from seed dispersal and the frugivores, the animals, they get important nutrients from the fruits. And in tropical rainforests, particularly 94% or up to 94% of the woody plants depend on this type of dispersal. Um, so they depend on the animals. Now, the question is, of course, how can this interaction then affect diversification or speciation? So now looking at the perspective of the plants, the frugivores will, by feeding on the fruits and dispersing the seeds, will establish new plant populations in the different places. By their movement behavior and frequency, they will determine the amount of gene flow between those plant populations. And if this is reduced for whatever reason, this may lead to reproductive isolation of the plants and ultimately speciation. So if these processes happen with a particularly rapid rate for whatever reason, this may lead to a shift in speciation rate also on macroevolutionary timescales potentially. So we can see from a phylogenetic perspective changes in speciation rates. Now, the interaction between the frugivores and the plants we know is not random. So the frugivores may have a certain fruit preference based on, for example, the color, the size or the shape of the fruits. And this fruit preference is also influenced by the ecological traits of the frugivores, such as their color vision, their body size and their gape width. So often we see these kind of matching traits, right? That frugivores with a particular color vision prefer particular colored fruits. Um, the one, the size matching is one of the most prominent um, interactions because the size of the fruit limits who can feed on it um, because you need a gape width large enough to swallow the fruits and seeds. And this means that if we compare small fruited plants, so relatively small, smaller than four centimeters, we can see a wide range of frugivores feeding on those like small bodied mammals, bats, birds, etc. And if we compare this to these very large megafaunal fruits, at least four centimeters with one or two very large seeds, they are restricted to large bodied animals for their dispersal. So nowadays you can think of elephants and tapirs, things like that. But of course, in the past, um, the world has seen a lot of megafaunal animals that have nowadays gone extinct. And these large bodied animals often also have the largest home range sizes and therefore move more frequently over very long distances. So therefore um, contribute disproportionately to long distance dispersal of these large fruited plants. And this may increase connectivity between the populations with large fruits and thereby also de decrease um, their chance to speciate by increased gene flow especially if we compare this to small fruited plants, which are dispersed by these more sedentary understory frugivores, mostly, um, which have a much more restricted dispersal. And this then combined with, of course, occasional long distance dispersal, for example, by large birds or large frugivores, may facilitate their speciation. So this is what I call the fruit size hypothesis. So to evaluate this hypothesis, I focus on the palm family. Um, so it's a typical tropical rainforest family. It has about 2,500 species globally. Um, and almost all of them are dispersed by animals. So they have vertebrate dispersed fruits. Um, the coconut and the nipa palm, uh, you may know, they are exceptions. They're dispersed by water. Um, and as you can see here in the top um, figure, most of them have small fruits, so smaller than four centimeters, but we still find at least 10% of the species that have these very large megafauna fruits. And you can see a couple of examples of these fruits here. So as you can imagine, there's not so many animals that can swallow these uh, fruits. So we can also look at the evolution of these megafauna fruits in a phylogenetic context. So here we have the phylogeny of the palms. Um, we see that they're about 110 million years old. And then this is a stochastic character mapping of the probability of megafauna fruits at the ancestral branches. So the more yellow, the higher the probability that those lineages had megafauna fruits. 
So we see that ancestrally palms had a high probability of having already these megafauna fruits. And this is also the time they co-occurred with dinosaurs. And there are indeed examples of fossilized palm seeds in um, dinosaur dung, a fossilized dinosaur dung. So these may have been the initial dispersers of these very large fruits. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. The other thing we see is that there's been many transitions then to smaller fruits. So that would be from the yellow branches going to the gray ones where there's probably small fruits. And we also see, for example, here and here and here that there have been reversals again to large fruits. So to understand what happened when they evolved large fruits, if that affected speciation rates, we use these diversification rate models that are probably familiar to many of you. They have some issues, but I'm not going to go into detail right now about that. Um, we take the dated phylogeny of the palms for the species today. We have data on whether they have small or large fruits, and we fit models to them to see whether small fruits and large fruits are different in their speciation rates, um, extinction rates, and also transition. So transition rate would be transitioning from large to small fruits or the other way around. And then we fit several models. So we, we choose the model which explains the data best with the fewest number of parameters. And then we fit this model in a Bayesian framework to get an estimate of these rates. So we're gonna focus on speciation for now. So here are the results. So on the y-axis, we have the speciation rate for the palms. In yellow, we have it for the small fruited lineages and in blue for the large or megafauna fruited lineages. And as you can see, although there is a lot of variation in speciation rates across lineages, generally these large fruited lineages have lower speciation rates than the small fruited lineages. So this supports indeed the idea that because of these historical interactions with megafauna, um, these large fruited lineages may have had frequent kind of gene flow between populations and a lower chance to speciate, right? Now, we also see a lot of variation unexplained. So there may be other variables that affect the speciation of these palms. One of them could be if you are an understory palm, which often have um, shorter generation times, they're shorter lived. And also they display the fruits in the understory. So they really increase the chance of dispersal by these sedentary understory frugivores. So the combination of small fruits and an understory growth form could also affect speciation rates. So this is then an interaction model where we compare speciation rates of a base model. So that would be large fruits and canopy palms. We see whether speciation rate shifts when they evolve small fruits or an understory growth form. And then we see whether there's support for an interaction term. And in this case, there is. So the highest speciation rates are found if you evolve small fruits and you have an understory growth form. If we look at this in different parts of the world, we actually see this interaction term only supported in new world palms and not in old world palms. Another thing that may of course facilitate speciation, which we know quite well is island colonizations because occurring on islands may increase isolation and therefore speciation. But to get to islands, for palms at least, you need fruits small enough to be swallowed by these birds and bats that can colonize the islands. So again, we test for this interaction of evolving small fruits and occurring on isolated islands. And also here we find that this interaction leads to the highest speciation rate. But then if we look at it in different parts of the world, we only find this supported in old world palms. And old world palms, I have to say, they mainly occur in Southeast Asia and Australasia. In Africa, there's very few palms, only uh, 68 species in mainland Africa. So from this, we see that there's an interaction with different traits. We see that high speciation rates evolve can occur when you evolve small fruits. And we think this is um, linked to the restricted dispersal behavior, right? Of these small bodied frugivores with occasional long distance dispersal to establish new populations. But it's not just fruit size. It's an interaction with an understory growth form, but only in new world palms and these island colonizations, but only in old world palms. 
And we think that these differences between new world and old world are linked to the different dispersal guilds that have evolved in these parts of the world. So in the new world, we find this very high diversity of these understory frugivores um, that often don't even cross rivers. So they have very restricted dispersal. And this may have facilitated um, speciation, especially if you have an understory growth form displaying your fruits in the understory. Whereas in, old, in the old world, mainly Southeast Asia, we find this very high diversity of these strong flying volant frugivores, such as fruit pigeons, hornbills, fruit bats. And they have been shown to successfully colonize isolated islands, which are also, of course, very dominant in this part of the world. So this may explain why we find the island effect only in the old world. So you may wonder, OK, this is all in the past where there was a rich megafaunal community. Nowadays, we may be facing extinctions, especially of these large bodied animals. And we have seen these extinctions already, right? The late quaternary led to most extinctions of the megafauna. But the late quaternary event is not the only defaunation event we have seen on Earth. Um, the Cretaceous had a lot of large bodied animals, um, dinosaurs. And of course, they went ex extinct about 66 million years ago. And this led to a, quite a unique period in life on Earth. It led to about 25 million years without mega herbivores. So mega herbivores now are defined as at least a thousand kilograms, so very large animals. Um, and it took about 25 year, million years for mammals to evolve body sizes equivalent to those of the large dinosaurs. So at least a thousand kilograms. So that's shown over here over time. We have the maximum size of mammals. We see in the Cretaceous, they were small. Then they increase gradually and then they reach these very large sizes about 40 million years ago. So we had a period here, which I call the mega herbivore gap. Um, and it's been quite a puzzling period for angiosperms, especially because this is the only time in their history that there weren't any mega herbivores around to interact with. Um, and we do know that vegetation generally interacts a lot with mega herbivores. Um, in this figure, you can see these different kinds of interactions. So the frugivory one I already presented, but of course also herbivory and plant defense against browsing and grazing and predation, etc., may be important interactions. And these mega herbivores, they often, you know, create open woodlands. Um, they break the vegetation. So they have all kinds of interesting functions um, in the ecosystem that were probably absent during that mega herbivore gap time. So the hypothesis here we want to see is whether indeed, you know, during the Cretaceous and then the later Cenozoic with large mammals, these mega herbivores created eco ecological opportunities for radiations. So we think, of course, that they may have interacted with megafaunal fruits, as I presented before, but they may also have led to, you know, the evolution of defense traits and radiations in lineages with defense traits, such as spines or other types of armature. But then during the mega herbivore gap, there would be the absence of these ecological opportunities. And this may therefore lead to shifts in diversification. Especially, we may expect that there have been slowdowns in those, those lineages that were interacting with the megafauna, mega herbivores. So lineages with megafauna fruits or those with armature or defense traits. And at the same time, because these selection pressures by mega herbivores were, um, were absent, there may have been the change in the traits. So we may have seen the loss of defense traits because they didn't provide an advantage anymore. And we may also see the transition to smaller fruits that are still dispersed by you know, smaller bodied mammals that were radiating during that time. So these are the two hypotheses I'm going to test again, this time um, with three time slices on the palm phylogeny. So we have diversification in the dinosaur times, then we have diversification in the mega herbivore gap. And then we have diversification more, more recent during the large bodied mammals with a similar set of diversification models. So first looking at the megafaunal fruits. So here we have speciation rates. Here we have for the three time slices. So the dinosaur times, the mega herbivore gap, 
and then the large mammal uh, time. And we see actually for lineages with megafaunal fruits that their uh, speciation rate didn't change over time. So we don't find support for this idea that during the mega herbivore gap, there were slowdowns. In terms of transition rates, so we expect a transition to smaller fruits, but in fact, we see during this mega herbivore gap that there is, is a very high transition to evolving large fruits. So it's, it's basically the opposite of what we expected during the mega herbivore gap. If we look at those palms with armature, so they have spines um, on the stems and the leaves, we do find support for a slowdown during the mega herbivore gap in the lineages with spines. Um, we also find that the transition rate of evolving spines slows down during the mega herbivore gap. Um, so this seems to support our expectation. Um, however, we do need, of course, to compare it to lineages without spines. So there's also palms, of course, without spines. And here we actually see that they also slow down in speciation rates during the mega herbivore gap. So it doesn't seem to be linked to the presence or absence of spines, this slowdown in speciation rates. However, we do see that transition rates for those didn't change. So the fact that they change for evolving spines may indeed be linked to the presence of the mega herbivores. So we, we see that the mega herbivore gap is probably associated with changes in diversification in plants. I mean, this we know already. Um, in this case, for palms, we actually find a slowdown. It's often seen in angiosperm lineages that they increase in diversification because of new ecological opportunities. Um, but we do see that it's not linked to any traits that um, are associated with mega herbivores. So there may be generally a speciation slowdown because of changing conditions, because this mega herbivore gap, of course, coincided with lots of changes that may have changed the selective landscape, right? So we see increasing temperatures, we see the expansion of tropical forests, um, and these things may have led to also changes in speciation rates. We do see that there's the evolution of armature or spines decreases during this time. And this may potentially be uh, linked to the absence of mega herbivores that browse the palms and, and feed on the leaves, et cetera. However, we do see the opposite if we look at megafauna fruits. So we see very high transition rates to evolving megafauna fruits during this time. Um, and we think this is linked to the fact that these megafauna fruits didn't entirely depend on mega herbivores for their dispersal. They can also be dispersed by animals that are, you know, that are maybe not a thousand kilograms, but are pretty large, like a hundred or 40 kilograms. And this means that these actually radiated during this time, during the mega herbivore gap. Um, we see many radiations of, of mammal groups happening. And these may then have selected for large fruits. And at the same time, we see the evolution of tropical forests with shady habitats, which may have also selected for larger seeds uh, to increase germination chances. So this is, of course, a bit speculative. It's a period very long back in time. Um, it's an interesting period, but as you can see, it's quite challenging to use macroevolutionary methods to understand what happens. So we may have to go a little bit closer to the present to really think about more the late quaternary extinctions and the effect on the dispersal of these very large fruits. Um, so this is the last part. And here we focus on Madagascar. And it used to have these giant lemurs and elephant birds that were probably important seed dispersers, um, but they were lost like all Madagascar's megafauna went extinct about 2000 years ago when, when humans arrived. So pretty recent. But we may expect that this um, affected the dispersal of these large fruits, um, maybe leading to dispersal limitation or spatial turnover of communities because of the absence of dispersal and connectivity between populations. And also genetic differentiation between populations. So this is illustrated over here, where we expect in frequent gene flow between populations when the megafauna is absent, uh, present, 
But then when they go extinct, we may see a decrease in connectivity and therefore genetic differentiation happening and potentially ultimately speciation, but we're, we're not there yet. So this is a couple of examples of these giant animals that lived on Madagascar in the past. And we still see many palms, especially palms, also other groups, but palms have many species still with these very large fruits on Madagascar. And here you see a couple of examples. So this is work led by Laura Mendes, my PhD student. Um, and she basically asked the question whether past dispersal by these mega frugivores of Madagascar has affected the spatial turnover or the composition of communities, as well as the genetic differentiation between populations. So we go a little bit into the microevolution here. And she collected meta community data uh, on, for 14 well sampled assemblages on Madagascar. 29 in the east of Madagascar, which is the more the tropical rainforest part, and then 11 in the west, which is more like open savannas. Um, so we noticed whether there were, which palm species were there, and also which frugivores they co-occurred with, and also which extinct frugivores they co-occurred with. I will get to get that in a second. And at the same time, we wanted to correct for climatic variables that may affect the composition of the palm species. So we used um, fossil sites and co-occurrence of these giant lemurs and elephant birds with other taxa that still live today to infer their likely ancestral ranges. So this is basically a kind of co-occurrence in the fossil site analysis and therefore assuming they had similar ranges as those species that still live today. So here are a couple of examples of how we inferred these ranges. So the first part is looking at composition of communities. Um, we used a dissimilarity matrix between assemblages and then distance-based redundancy analysis to find out what are the most important drivers of beta diversity. Is it the abiotic environment? Is it the co-occurrence with these extinct frugivores? Is it the extant frugivores that still live today? Or is it spatial predictor? So we want to correct for it. You know, distance between communities will, of course, lead to turnover. So here are the results. So in these blobs, we have the total explained variation in beta diversity. And then each, for each of these parts, we see for each group how much variation was explained in the beta diversity. So what we see for all assemblages and the eastern ones is that the present frugivores explain the largest part in turnover. We see an additional role for the environment. So that's the abiotic environment mainly. And then we also see that these extinct frugivores have still left their signature on the beta diversity of the palms. Um, this is especially the case in the West where it's the only actually predictor besides the spatial predictors coming out as important for the turnover of palms. We can also look at which exact frugivores and variables explain this. So for the extant frugivores, we find a mix of lemurs, of course, that are important, but also more generalist birds that feed on lots of fruit types and also secondary dispersal by rodents. For the extinct frugivores, we find a mix of species, extinct um, giant lemurs and elephant birds. And then for the abiotic environment, we find things that we know are important for a palm community composition, such as temperature and forest cover and uh, presentation. Now, we also sampled for four species, several populations. Um, to look at the gene genetic differentiation. So here we have three species sampled which have these very large fruits. And then in the comparison, one species with smaller fruits that co-occurs with these large fruits at once. And Laura applied red sequencing. So for about seven or to, to 10 individuals per population and identified then SNPs that were used to calculate FST, so genetic differentiation between populations. So this is very preliminary. This, she provided this just a week ago. Each dot is the FST. So it's a comparison between two populations. 
we have here the species. So the blue one is the one with small fruits. The other ones have large fruits. And here I just compared it to the number of shared frugivores. So we would expect that if species share more frugivores, populations share more frugivores, that they will be more connected and therefore have a lower FST. And we only find that here for the small fruited species as expected because these large fruits are not actually dispersed by these smaller bodied animals that are still there. However, if we look at the extinct frugivores shared, we see that for all species and especially those with large fruits, if you shared more frugivores, mega frugivores in the past, you still have a lower FST. So it does suggests that past dispersal by these mega frugivores is still visible in the genetic structure of these populations and how well they are connected. So from this, we first saw that the um, past dispersal by these mega frugivores may have left some signature on the species composition still of the palms today, but a lot of it, a lot of the variation is actually explained by present day factors. But we also see that these extinct megafrugivores may have left signatures on the genetics of the palms. Um, if you share more frugivores in the past, you ha still have a lower FST. So concluding from all of this, um, I've shown you that this idea that the interactions between plants and animals, especially in terms of frugivory, may have affected evolutionary radiations of the plants. These may be adaptive radiations, um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But what I do think is that because of these interactions, the diversity we see today in tropical forests is for a large part determined by these past interactions and radiations. Also, if we go more recent um, to the late quaternary extinctions of megafauna, they may have left and still show signatures of their past dispersal dynamics for plants with very large fruits. And more generally, I think including the ecology or functional traits in evolutionary studies at different levels from micro to macro levels could provide a really more integrated view of the past and, and understanding where this diversity comes from and how speciation happens. So some of the work I presented is already published, some of it is not. So let me know if you'd like um, a PDF of this, you can just send me an email. I'd like to thank all the people that contributed to what I presented today, especially Laura, of course, my PhD student leading the Madagascar work, um, and Peter Linder for introducing me to the Mega Herb Before Gap, and Daniel Kisling for introducing me to Palms. And with this, I'd be happy to take questions if there's any time left. Thank you. Thanks very much, Renske. That was very fascinating. Um, Given that we have not that much time, I will just ask one question, which was written by Goran Ornquist. He would like to know if there are any confounding effects of generation time or effective population size on net absolute speciation rates in palms, which could perhaps, um, for instance, lo low population size could slow down net speciation rates. Sorry, can you repeat that. the question? You fell out. I didn't hear you for a second. OK. Could there be any confounding effects of generation time and effective population size on net absolute speciation rates in palms? Like for instance, low effective population size could slow down the net speciation rates. Yes, I think, I think this could very well be the case. And I think this would be very interesting to study. Um, we don't know that much about generation time in palms. Um, we have some some estimates for some species, but generally this needs more studying to really link these things together. But yeah, this will be an important variable to, to investigate. Thanks very much. There will be more time in the discussion session. Thanks. So now I hand over to Sean. Okay, yes, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ole Seehausen. Ole is the head of the Division of Aquatic Ecology and group leader of the Biodiversity Dynamics Group at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Ole's research uh, focuses on understanding the evolutionary processes and ecological mechanisms that generate and maintain biological diversity. And he spent 30 years addressing these questions in fishes, 
primarily in the spectacular radiations of cichlid fishes in African lakes. And an outstanding feature of Ole's research, which is really pertinent to this network, is the integration of diverse data sets across different spatial and temporal scales. And I'm sure this will be a key feature of his talk today titled Confronting Paleoecology, Population Gen Genomics and Phylogenomics in the Study of Cichlid Fish Adaptive Radiation. So thanks, Ole, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sean, for the introduction. And thanks to this group for inviting me to speak here. I'm trying to share my screen. Does it look OK? Great. Yeah. Excellent. So um, yeah, I'm going to present a little bit about different ways we are trying to understand what explains enormous variation in the rate at which new species arise and not just new species, but entire, as I will try to show you, which entire communities and food webs evolve. So when I think of the micro macro evolution gap that I'm hoping to somehow fill with our research, I often think of very rich communities of coexisting species that interact in complex ways. Like here, this beautiful slide on a coral reef shows you a, bunch of different acanthomorph fish. All of these fish on the slide are actually relatively close related. They're all acanthomorphs, which is the, by far the largest group of vertebrates. About um, one third of all vertebrate species are acanthomorph fish. So this is about 14, more than 14,000 species. But, um, and they're, they're fantastic in making these rich communities tropically very diverse and all of that. But what's really difficult to connect the emergence of this um, of this diversity to the microevolution process is, of course, the long time that has passed since the speciation events that created mo most of those lineages that now make this community. So if you go to a reef like this, the most closely related two species of acanthomorphs that you would see there would typically be several million years divergent from each other. Luckily, and that's probably because this ecosystem is relatively old and has assembled uh, mostly a long time ago. But there are replicates, much smaller replicates of these ocean ecosystems in inland oceans and mainly in the big lakes of Africa. And because lakes don't have this long geological um, survival time that the ocean obviously has, these are much younger. So these are the cichlid fish in the African Great Lakes that I decided to study many years ago and I'm still happy continuing with. Um, these are the African Great Lakes, uh, Victoria up there in the north and Malawi in the south. And then on the left there is, um, is Tanganyika. Actually, can you see my mouse? Yes, let me see if I can change this thing again. Um, spotlight on. Okay, so these are the legs. And each of these, oh, now my slides are frozen. Okay, each of these lakes has um, a very large diversity of endemic cichlid fish that are not found anywhere else. Um, you see those numbers here, they are approximate, and also many of the medium-sized lakes in the area and even some of the small lakes have endemic species. Um, these lineages of cichlids are actually quite widespread in Africa. They're not, the lineages are not endemic to these lakes. These lineages occur in rivers and wetlands all around the continent, but they haven't diversified in any of these environments. It's when they colonize lakes that they diversify. And this generalist ancestor that you find in, in the rivers around many parts of Africa has diversi diversified in each lake into distinct ecomorphs that do very different things in the ecosystem. Like at the bottom here, it's a big predator that feeds on other cichlids. And up here, for instance, is a small planktivore that lives in the open water like, like sardines and in big shoals feeding on plankton. Um, this happened in each of these lakes. It happened in parallel. We know that these are pretty much independent evolutionary radiations into very similar sets of ecomorphs. But it's not just this set of ecomorphs, it's that every ecomorph is represented in each lake by many, many different species. So here's just um, the range of species in Lake Victoria that you would typically find in an area that you can sample within a day. So these are 
by all means sympatric species. So extremely high sympatric richness, just like in the acanthomorphs and the coral reef. In fact, entire food webs have evolved with species feeding from various trophic levels, at least three trophic levels from feeding on phytoplankton or filamentous algae, uh, feeding on uh, grazers like snails and insects and copepods, to feeding on other cichlids, like some feed on the scales of other cichlids, some feed on the eggs, and some are top predators that actually feed on, on smaller cichlids. And so my question in terms of trying to use microevolution to understand the macroevolutionary outcome of processes is to understand how can this generalist that swims in the rivers around these lakes, why and how can it diversify into these food webs? In, as I will show you in sometimes very little time and make these beautiful communities that, that in many ways are actually quite similar to the reefs in the oceans. Um, for some reason, I actually don't see my full slide. There's always this bar on top, which I can't really get away, it seems. Um, all right. So um, on the one hand, we have started several years ago now, more than 10 years ago to use macroevolutionary methods to, um, to understand what predicts this diversification events. And this can be, this works reasonably well to extract large patterns. So here, this was work done by back then my postdoc Katie Wagner is now a professor at Wyoming. We assembled a large um, phylogeny that in which every colonization of a lake in Africa was, was um, retained. So all the, the, the lineages in rivers were pruned from this tree. And so every tip is a colonization of a lake. And then these colored dots show you whether they have in the lake speciated into at least two endemic species and sometimes several hundred. And so this happened in many places across Africa. We also some collected for each of these lakes, many environmental variables. We collected for each of these lineages, many trade variables. We tried to use um, the comparative method to identify variables that are correlated with the processes of diversification. And Katie found that among the variables that we looked at, there's especially two sets of variables the depth of lakes and the amount of energy through sunlight that these ecosystems receive um, on the one hand and um, a, a sexual dichromatism, the presence of this type of uh, coloration that you see down here where the males only express this bright nuptial coloration and the females are completely cryptic in their coloration. It's those two, so the, the, this trait and the, and the ecosystem um, variable water depth and energy that very consistently predicted whether the lineage when it colonizes the lake radiates or not. We interpreted that in terms of ecological opportunity, water depth, as I'll tell you in a moment, is very provides ecological opportunity um, and sexual selection. So mating systems that evolve under sexual selection. Um, we also have a often taken a micro evolutionary perspective on this same process. And we've shown um, both in my group and in other groups like here, Milan Malinsky's work at Cambridge, that lake cichlids actually often speciate on the depth gradients where species in this case, this is in a crater lake that Milan studied in shallow water, the light environment here is white light and there's and, and the visual system is adapted to performing well in this condition in deep water in this lake, the water is greenish and the breeding coloration of the males also um, corresponds to these differences in the visual environment. So males reflect the color that is best visible in the local environment. At the same time, populations undergo divergent selection, ecological selection on the visual system between these systems. And if these divergent ecological selection on the visual system and sexual selection on the male mating traits um, are um, spatially correlated along these depth gradients, that's how we think speciation is sometimes facilitated. It's not the only way speciation happens in these cichlids, and it's also not the only way in which depth matters to cichlid speciation, but it's one. Um, but, and so I'm now trying to, through the rest of the talk, I will build this sort of conceptual visual model for you, where I just um, make this Venn diagram of variables or factors that 
we think are important and ask if their coincidence matters to whether speciation happens or not. So in this case here, we concluded back then that uh, sexual selection and evolvable mating trait system on the one hand and ecological opportunity, especially resource gradients that couple ecology with reproductive isolation are uh, facilitating the origin of radiations. But that's only explaining part of the variation in whether there's radiation or not. And there's also this, this comparative macroevolutionary um, methods is one way to look at try and bridge the gap between micro and macroevolution by, by extracting the, the, um, the large patterns that, that we see in, in the phylogenetic trees and extract, inferring from that processes that we can then go in with microevolutionary work and study in these populations like in the crater lake that Milan worked on. Um, there's another way now, and that is looking at um, trying to find radiations that have happened so recently that the macroevolutionary process has actually unfolded on microevolutionary population genetic timescales. And that is, if you, these are the radiations in the African Great Lakes, and I write in each of them how many years they had to unfold. So Lake Tanganyika, about 10 million years, but Lake Victoria, 15,000 years. So there's 15, by now we think it's probably more 17,000 now, but nevertheless, super short. Um, and that is really the time scale at which this, this diversification can be started with population genetic and microevolutionary approaches. Um, if someone knows how I can remove this top bar that I used to, um, can't remove this top bar here today. And it, it blinds me partly to my slides, which is very, annoying. So the, the models that I just try to tell you about, the sexual selection interaction with ecological opportunity can actually not explain the massive variation in rates that we see across the cyclic trees. So some years ago, uh, Matt McGee and Sam Borstein and me and others built this large tree across all of, of cichlids, not just African cichlids, about 18,000 species on this tree and inferred rate shifts. And there's immense rate shifts. So diversification rates within cyclids vary by four orders of magnitude. And they vary even among the lake radiations by three orders of magnitude. So in this tree, Tanganyika starts here, but Victoria starts up here. And so the, the rates are incredibly, incredibly different. Um, and I think we need to understand what explains these enormous differences in rates in order to be able to bridge the micro macro evolutionary gap. Another way you can see that this previous simple model with sexual selection and ecological opportunity is insufficient comes from just looking at this one lake, Lake Victoria. Um, that, lake, that lake has been colonized and the lakes around it have been colonized by five different types of cichlids here that all share the mating trait system, sexual selection and sexually dichromatic coloration and several killifish that also all share that. And yet um, none of them has radiated except for one. And what I'm trying to show you in here, these little abbreviations are the lakes they colonized. And when this is just, there's no number behind it, it means they've colonized and done nothing, no speciation. And this lineage has colonized also all these little lakes and large lakes. And this is the number of species that it has produced in each of them. Um, so these are the lakes, just again, so there's little lakes and larger lakes, and I'm now talking just of this area within Lake Victoria, for which we have very good data on the presence and absence of various lineages of fish. Turns out that out of these, all, all these killifish and one of these cichlids actually never go into deep water, so you never ever find them deeper than two meters water depth, which to my mind suggests that niche conservatism constraints adaptive radiation. These other lineages though go deep. So we can add now to this model, probably that ecological versatility. So the opposite maybe of niche conservatism is important additionally to ecological opportunity and sexual selection. That's not surprising. It's actually part of classical adaptive radiation uh, theory. Um, but it's still not sufficient because as I told you, these other cichlids have colonized at least nine of these lakes as well, and have not once radiated. Whereas this one lineage here, 
it's colonized those same legs and radiated every time. So it so we need to understand this highly predictable outcome of who among simulars radiates. Now, the first question here is that you might have, and I had, is how do we know that this are really many independent radiations? Isn't this just one big radiation that then spread itself over those legs? So there's really nothing to be explained here because sample size is one. One has radiated and others haven't. And to resolve that, we went into great effort to sequence many, many different species across this super region, across this super flock, we call it, and reconstruct with whole genome sequence data uh, the phylogeny of these radiations. And this is work Joanna Maya is preparing for submission currently. And all I want to show you is this is all, this is all these different cichlids. And orange branches are all in Lake Victoria, then light blue neck Edward, darker blues in Lake Kivu and Lake Saka, and this red in Lake Kagera. And I'm just pointing you to the monophyly of each of these radiations, except one. So Edward and Kivu are mixed, but within each Edward and Kivu, there's radiation. And all the others are strictly monophyletic radiations. And especially this huge one, Lake Victoria, strictly a monophyletic radiation. So really these radiations have happened repeatedly, predictably in this one lineage. And yet Lake Victoria just told you it's the largest radiation, but we know it's very young. Um, it's good evidence that 16,000 years ago, the lake didn't exist. So, so have these species really been able to radiate in that little time that these modern lakes um, provide, or might they have survived in, in the swamps as the lake dried up and then they, they somehow survived and the lake fills up again. So the radiation is actually older than the lakes. To address that question, um, David Marquez has been working for several years on many of these genomes to use um, demographic analysis of population genomic data, mostly using MSMC IM, but now also using um, some more site frequency based methods, but I'm showing you today MSMC IM output. And so David has been able to estimate for each of the lakes in the region. So this is, this is the, the phylogeny as estimated by Joanna. This phylogeny, this entire super flock was seeded as we know from Joanna's earlier work by hybridization between these two lineages from the Congo and the Nile. And now David has use the genomes from within each of these lakes to estimate the divergence or the, the distribution of split times between lakes and within lakes. And I just want to focus you on this yellow part of the distributions. This is the within lake radiations. And this is Victoria. And so we used, David used for that, he estimated mutation rates from experimental families in the lab. We also estimated recombination rates from our, our crosses and we know the generation time of this fish. So this is the only variables that, that constraint variables that go into the, the analysis. And we, David arrived at this distribution here of split times. So Lake Victoria, he concludes has really started less than 20,000 years ago. Um, the, the lakes that may not have been completely dry started a little earlier. And the little crater lake that we know is about 4,000 years old is of volcanic origin. Um, David is able to estimate the speciation in there to have occurred about 3,000 years ago. So it looks like they really radiated within the time confines of these modern lakes. So then why only this one group? Why did the others not do that as well? So one thing we thought is historic contingency. So might there be a priority effect? The one lineage happened to be there before the others. To get at that, we started using paleoecology. So several years ago, um, part of my team embarked on an expedition to Lake Victoria with our colleagues from the Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute to drill, to not drill, to core through the sediments of Lake Victoria all the way to the origin of the lake and then study the content of this cores for fossils and reconstruction of the paleo environment. Here's mostly the people that in my group are most heavily involved with that, and particularly Mary Salome and Moritz went and caught and, and did the sampling of the cores in Lake Victoria. And Nara is our PhD student who's currently studying the, fossil, the fish fossils in these. This is a large collaborative project, and 
with many people involved and I'm very grateful to them allowing me to show some figures that only emerged at the beginning of this week. So this is super, super new data. It's really just coming together. So we have between, between the groups of Martin Grosjean, the paleolimnology at Bern, Blake Matthews, um, food web ecology and community ecology at Erwag and Tom Gilbert with ADNA in Copenhagen and Moritz Muschig, my senior postdoc, mostly focusing on, on ancient DNA work. And then our four PhD students, Nare, Leighton, Yunuen, and Julia, um, we've just reconstructed um, some really interesting things. So here's, I show you here, the beginning of the lake down here, these are our four cores. Um, we reconstructed, this is the work by Julia, we reconstructed the lake level through time. It, it was indeed a seasonal desiccation surface around when our core start, it was completely dry just under this, and then it fills up rapidly. Um, and now, and as beautiful transitions in the entire environment. So we see initially the lake is surrounded by savanna, then it becomes a rainforest, a closed rainforest that covers the landscape for several thousand years in the history of this radiation until it more recently returns to open landscape. What about fish? So here's, the distribution of just from one of our cores, the most offshore core, distribution of fossils assigned by Nare to families of fish. What you see is that early on, there are many different groups. There are cichlids. In fact, there are cichlids of both of these types, those that radiate and don't radiate. There are cyprinids. There are different groups of catfish. Um, then as the, lake, as the lake becomes deep, those other fish disappear and only cichlids remain. And now as the lake is deep and open in this, it is now really an offshore inland ocean site where this core has been collecting sediment and fossils from. There's only cichlids there. And then about 5,000 years ago, the system opens up, the landscape opens up, the lake becomes a bit more eutrophic and the cichlid abundance increases in this offshore area. So, we can conclude from that two things. One that we've already, with a much smaller data set shown a few years ago, is that priority effects probably not important. All these lineages were there together with the radiating group right from the beginning. There's no evidence that one group arrived before the others, but the data confirmed the importance of versatility. So as I showed you, when the environment changes from a shallow um, wetland to a deep inland ocean, the other fish all disappear. And it's just cichlids that in the open water stay there right from the beginning. So that probably speaks to the versatility and to the, therefore the ecological opportunity of water depth that isn't actually, um, isn't actually available for many of the other lineages. But still doesn't explain why similar cichlid lineages did not um, radiate. So then we ask, is it something about the kind of genetic variation? And as many, many of you know, phylogenomic analysis over the last few years for all of these African Great Lakes have shown that all of these radiations evolved importantly hybridization between distantly related lineages at the onset of these radiations. This is the first of these papers from uh, Joanna's work that showed that all the cichlids in the, all the radiations, each tip here is a radiation, not a species, in this part of Africa emerged after hybridization between this relatively distant relatives from the Nile and the Congo. Um, so here's this, uh, these statistics, um, access allele sharing summary plots that Joanna made several years ago, showing that each of these lakes, again, each of these is a radiation, shares very similar access allele sharing um, with this distant relative from the upper Nile. We also have shown that adaptive polymorphisms um, that are important to speciation and speciation and adaptation along depth, namely the visual system, the genes in the visual system, have the polymorphisms in these genes have arisen through this past hybridization event. In the meantime, we also showed in work in a paper published by Matt McGee, my postdoc then, um, two years ago, um, that this is true for other regions in the genome. So here, for instance, a map shows that a haplotype associated with predatory 
morphologies, these big piscivores that have evolved in all of these lakes, that they actually use, reuse the same haplotype that is characterized by several larger indels, these yellow gaps here in the alignment, um, whereas, um, whereas each um, the phylogeny of these lakes looks is on the right here. So of course the species from the same lakes are always each other's closest relatives. Um, in those regions here, in this case, that relate to Piscivory, they share um, very close to related haplotypes, even yeah. across radiations that are millions of years different from one another. Um, more globally, Matt showed that he did some GWAS type analysis on large indel polymorphisms within Lake Victoria and shows here the distribution of indels over chromosomes that are significantly associated with ecology, diet, habitat, or nuptial coloration within the Lake Victoria radiation. And then looks at the sharing of the Lake Victoria radiation, that the Lake Victoria radiation has with older other cichlids at these polymorphisms. And so here's the sharing with the founding lineages, which is not surprisingly, of course, very high, um, but sharing with the cichlid radiation in Lake Kivu and even sharing with the radiation that is many million years divergent in Lake Muero. So, um, so here we really conclude that um, these radiations are characterized by the availability of a very rich set of, of um, haplotypes that matter to ecology and some of which matter to mate, mating patterns that these, that these populations can access, apparently do access through repeated hybridization and that might play an important role in the radiation. Um, work in progress by Joanna is showing that that radiation, even within Lake Victoria, uh, the origin of new species, the origin of new clades, and the origin of entire trophic groups is again and again associated with major hybridization events. So here's the origin of this entire regional lineage that Joanna showed several years ago to be of hybrid origin. Now she shows that after the Lake Victoria um, emerged, it was colonized again by two by one lineage from here, another one from here that read that hybridized. And then, and then again, and then within the Lake Victoria radiation, entire new trophic groups like dwarf predators here, it's one trophic group that Joanna has been working on, has arisen through hybridization between zooplanktivores and large predators within Lake Victoria. So really this process of mix of fission and fusion and remixing and selection on old genetic variation seems tremendously important. What we are currently doing is now um, working on the demographics based on whole genomes and matching that to the paleoecology. So I showed you this plot about similar before. This is one of the other cores that we took. Again, fish other than cichlids disappear when the lake becomes deep. Cichlids are rare, but they're present. And then they increase 5,000 years ago. Now, David reconstructed with MSMC-IM the split times between, between all these different trophic groups in the lake. And it turns out that if we take um, M MT.5, so when genomes between species are coalesced about 50%, as roughly when speciation begins, as some people have suggested in the past, as a first crude approximation, turns out that all these speciation events fall into this phase between the filling of the lake and then about 5,000 years ago, when the lake was really oligotrophic and probably much clearer water than we've ever seen, even in historical times in these lakes. Very interestingly, um, this group of, oh, wait, maybe I should go, yeah, so very interestingly, David can also infer the ecology of these lineages from MSMCIM, namely through, uh, through assessing effective population size. And he can show that the predators always have much smaller effective population size than insectivores and the little pelagic plantivores have the largest effective population size. By doing that, we see that the plantivores, this is this separation, is 
pelagic zooplanktivores, pelagic phytoplanktivores separate from littoral cichlids only 4,000 years ago, which is exactly the time they become abundant in the offshore habitat. So we're trying to and, and, and we're trying to use now bring together, and this is really a work in progress. So I apologize that this doesn't is not very cleanly presented yet. I'm just so excited about it. We just really get this data in now. We're trying to confront the paleoecology, the paleontology of these fossils with the demographics and population genetics to, re to understand the rates and the chronology in which this food web evolves. So this is it. Um, so I think the more complete and probably not full conceptual model now involves additionally to ecological versatility, evolvable mating trade system and ecological opportunity, hybridization that generates and maintains many genetic polymorphisms that readily respond to selection. And this now, I think, I feel like we, 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 have, we understand a little bit about this system now, and it would be very interesting to now take this, this conceptual model out tested across the tree of life with comparative methods. This tests exist for most of these components on their own but the interaction between all of them hasn't really been tested. And it's also limited by available sample sizes and replication of all of these things. But I think we're, this is something that will happen over the next few years. It will be, become possible with comparative methods across the tree of life to test whether this, the interaction of such factors may actually have played a role in shift, shifts in diversification rates more generally. Um, if there are any questions, um, this is the end of my presentation. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Ole. Really fascinating system and really kind of incredible data that you guys are bringing together. So we do have a few questions in the chat, but I've actually they're actually quite pertinent to some of the discussion uh, topics that we have organised. And given that we're quite over time, I think we should just switch into the discussion. Uh, we can kind of work these questions in there. So uh, if you just scroll up into the chat, you'll see that uh, Chris Cooney has posted the link to the discussion session. So we can just head over there now and um, we'll uh, stop this link. But yeah, thank you everyone for attending the talks. Really fascinating. Um, yeah, thanks.